Do you think it's fair that if you're a woman or a minority, you can make 48% less than your male counterparts? Stay tuned and we'll talk about it. of the Talk Around Town show. How's everybody doing today? Good. Right. I took Courtney to the gym yesterday. Got you know, I saw there. that picture online. Can you look at that picture? No. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. There's look, she's smiling. Right there, she's a, she's a, I think you just started regretting working out with me, right? <laughs> Asked me to train with you. No. I had her doing, uh, we were doing shoulder presses the other day, and then yesterday was uh, was back and chest day, so we were doing some lat pull downs. And were they um, on the uh, on the Smith machine where you're, you're, where yeah, you're yeah. like squatting down? Oh, those are fun. Oh, I did such a good workout. It's a great yeah. workout. Such a good workout. Super so, <laughs> Daniel, you've got yourself a new haircut. Looking I do. Pretty fresh and clean there. Well, it's my old haircut, kind of, um, <laughs> because my my barber Nadari usually comes to my house and cuts my hair, but he was out of town, mm. so I went to another guy who just totally botched it. And so Nadari had to come and fix my hair, and so he took a little bit extra off, but I love it. That's why you, you go to the same barber. Like, <laughs> yes. I have one barber, it's called Brooklyn's Finest. I go there, Arthur is amazing. Yeah. And he gets me done, he gets it taken care of. Yeah. I haven't been to him in a while, which so is why I'm bald. bald. <laughs> I refuse to go to anybody else, because the yeah. last time I did, I'm the same way with my hair. You Whoever does your hair right, you stick with them. That's you're true. thick and thin. They know your most deepest, intimate hard. secrets. You know, the it's funny good. thing about barbers, historically, in the um, in the Middle Ages, they were before doctors came around. Mm -hmm. They were doctors. Like the barber would wheel into town in his cart, really? and he would cut people's hair, but he would also remove teeth. Really? He would also set bones. I didn't know that. Yeah, they would do all that stuff huh. until doctors came over from like Persia or something. <laughs> Learn something new every day. Stick around because we have a great show for you today. We're going to talk to Regina Edwards, who's the CEO of YWCA Metropolitan Phoenix. And we're going to take a look at a helicopter on the show. So Super cool helicopter. Stay tuned. Like we'll be right back. segment is brought to you by Anabi Law, the entrepreneur's law firm. Call today to arrange a free consultation at 602-845-0152. Welcome back to the show. Today's first guest is a powerhouse of a woman. She is the CEO of the YWCA of Metropolitan Phoenix and they deal with empowering women, not just women, but, but education and kids and the community and a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to find out about all that. Uh, Regina, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I, I know, love to talk about the YWCA. <laughs> so tell us about the, well, first about the, the, the history of the YWCA. I didn't even know it existed. So the YWCA has a great history. Here in Arizona, we've been here since 1912. So the same year as statehood. So for over 103 years, we've been in the community working to empower women and eliminate racism. And we do that in a number of ways. So there are two signature programs that I want to talk about today. Mm -hmm. One is our financial education program, which is called Own It. So is your checkbook balance every month? When you ask most people, they say, oh, maybe not. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> Probably maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> um, so what we do in that program that makes it unique is we work with other nonprofits across the community. So at any point in time, we might be working with 30 or 40 other nonprofits bringing the program to them. So let's say you're a domestic violence shelter, or you might be a program that works with hunger, or you might be a program that works with kids in some way. We come in and work directly with you and the clients you're already serving and do a comprehensive financial education program. That's important. And what's really great about it is that we do very specific pre and post measurements. So the first day in class, we ask individuals to fill out 
some questions and tell us a little bit about what their goals are. And then we walk through it. So over the four weeks, we're always going to go back to those goals. Okay. So your goal might be, I just want to pay the rent every month. Mm -hmm. Your goal might be, I want to save for college for my kids. I want to save for a house. So we go through the class, we give them all the tools and skills and structure to be able to really have a solid budget. And then about nine months later, we call everyone and say, how are you doing? And we know that over 75% of the people in the program have met their goals and are continuing to meet those goals. So it's a huge success if you think about our community and you think about what economic empowerment and financial stability so means. So important. Very important. Yeah. Especially in this, uh, the, the, the current economic climate that yeah. we've got. People don't know how to, don't. how are we mm -hmm. meeting ends meet? What, what's the saying? Robbing mm -hmm. Peter to pay Paul. So you guys are right. going into these organizations and, and teaching mm -hmm. people, you know, showing people some tools. And that's brilliant. Yeah. And what's great is in working with those other organizations, and I know both of you have experience in the community, when you're a program person, you're really focused on that program and what you're doing. Yeah. So when we come in and do the financial education part, it really builds the capacity of the organization. And they know that not only are the individuals that I'm serving getting assistance with whatever my program is, but now they have this whole program around financial education that doesn't take away or use the agency's resources, but helps to build that individual's capacity right. and opportunity as they move through their program. So we're really proud of that one. There was a video that, uh, that Dan showed us back in June of mm -hmm. this year where um, the YWCA, uh, there was a, an empowerment luncheon, right. something like that, and there were... Um, couple of sports icons there. Misty Hyman, the Olympic gold medalist. Um, mm -hmm. Nona Lee, uh, the senior VP of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, how did this, how, how do events like this help uh, empower and benefit the community? Well, we do um, another really fabulous series that we call our Women's Empowerment Luncheon. And this started many years ago. And over time, we've had folks like Mavis Leno come and talk about her work in Afghanistan. We've had Gloria Steinem, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Oh we've had local authors, and it's all about um, highlighting women in the community and across the country, the work they're doing and what people are doing locally. So just last week we had the CEOs of three major hospitals, which you may not know, but three of the largest hospitals in town are run by women. So wow. St. Joseph's, Dignity wow. Health CEO, Patty White, uh, Cardin uh, Children's Hospital is a woman CEO, and the new one of the newly combined Honor Health which was Scottsdale and John C. Lincoln. And they had fabulous stories to share about their journey through mm -hmm. healthcare and their leadership qualities that they share with the community, with their patients, with their staff. So we do these once a quarter. The next one coming up is gonna be in January, Women Who Build Arizona, where we'll have uh, architects and contractors and women who have been That's engaged fantastic. in building projects across the community. And then um, we're also going to do two more of those throughout the year. But what it does is it really highlights the women in our community and the work that they're doing, not yeah. just in their sector, so healthcare or construction or sports as an example, but really talks about how they also give back to the community and how they're building the real structure and fiber in our community. Wow. And that's, that's a fun one that we that's do. That's super fun. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, your next seminar is in January? Mm -hmm. Then in April yeah. is going to be our wage equity luncheon. And I think you all know a little bit about what's going on in the world with uh, the lack, shall we say, of right. women's equal pay. So one of the things that we also do, a great program, has to do all around wage equality. So every year you hear about what women make on the dollar compared to men mm -hmm. and what a whole range of women um, who come from different racial and ethnic groups, what they make. So one of the challenges that we always say is, well, you can talk about it, but w so what? So yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. What right. are you going to do? Right. So there's a great program that we've been doing for a couple of years, and it's a salary negotiation program. It's a very comprehensive program that trains women about how to negotiate not just their salary, but also all the benefits. Mm -hmm. And when women leave the class, it's amazing. Not only the skills, the empowerment, the yeah. confidence, because it's great. It's not only, so let's say I work in a nonprofit. Well, there's probably not a long way to go in terms <laughs> of when I go into negotiate, but what about other things? Maybe I can talk to my supervisor about time off to take a class. Right. Maybe I could ask if the organization would help pay for some additional professional development. Maybe it's flex time. Maybe it's 
if you're still going to school, let's say your company doesn't have a tuition program, but why not say, gosh, what about $100 every quarter to help pay for books? Right. So it's very empowering, but it also addresses that. We can talk all day about the wage gap, but if we don't start to do something, nothing's gonna change. Nothing's ever gonna change. So one, one woman at a time. But it's a great program, and it's a partnership that we do with the American Association of University Women. But it's very powerful because they'll come back and say, "I use those skills. Here's what I was able to do. I use those skills." That's what we want to hear. That's that's something that I, I, I really did want to address, and you address it without even, even asking about it. You know, the the wage gap, not just with yeah. with, with women, but then if you're a minority, it, it, it changes even more. So mm-hmm. being a minority woman, the the program that you guys are. Uh, you guys are doing, I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. One of the challenges is we often talk in generalities. So yeah. we say that across the country, it's set women make 78 cents per to a dollar for a man. In yeah. Arizona, it's 81 cents. But if you look at it's it, some of, the, <laughs> some of the statistics that, so the, the general number of 78 cents is kind of across the board, looking very specifically, mm-hmm. you know, very, very similar. But then when you start to look at women of color, you'll find that depending on what time of the year, it takes women of color even longer. Mm -hmm. So for example, the statistics haven't come out for next year, but we know that next year it's by women in 2016 will have to work until April 12th to make Mm -hmm. the same amount. And they're still working on the statistics for women of color. So an African-American woman, let's say, may have to work until July. A Hispanic woman Mm -hmm. may have to work till September. So if you think about that gap, it's, That's it's insane. Unreasonable. Yeah. It's unreasonable. So we all have to come together and see what we can do about it. So hopefully, when fix that you know problem. when Courtney yeah. is my age, it there won't even be there. Right. Oh, but that it is better, madness. It better not still be seventy-eight <laughs> right. cents, but hopefully it won't be there at all. Georgina, I, I see a little thingy there behind you. What is wh- what is this that you brought with? Abby? It's a thingy. So we are really excited about oh. this. I want to do a, oh, um, a shout out. Billboard. It's cute. Little billboard. <laughs> These aren't these great. Yeah. A little shout out to Outfront advertising. Uh, Working with Outfront, we were able to get a number of these billboards. You'll see there are six of them around the valley. And Outdoor provided these to us at no cost. Wow. Thank you, Outdoor. Yeah. Woo. Phil Callahan. (laughs) Um, So one of the things, as as you said earlier, sometimes people don't know about the YWCA, but Mm -hmm. we're here. We've been here since 1912. So this is part of our reaching out and branding campaign. So you'll see these all across the valley. This is our signature one. And then we have different ones that talk about our financial education Mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. We have one that talks about all the work we do right here in the West Valley with seniors. And we have just a number of them. So look for them. All over the board. All across the valley. (laughs) And uh, in addition to this, we're going to be starting to look at potentially doing some PSAs. We have a number of really strong, like yourselves, community partners that we really want to get the word out and tell people yeah. what we are and what we do in the community. Well, Regina, thank you so much. Um, with, if people want to get in touch with the YWCA, I see there's a, see a our, website our there. our website <laughs> also just newly branded, um, ywcaaz.org. We, as you can tell, we're excited about what we do. We feel very passionate about our yeah. mission of eliminating racism and empowering mm-hmm. women. We're here in the community and we'd love to talk to you about how you can support us and work with us. Well, Regina, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be right back. Hi, guys. This is Colleen Mass from the Talk Around Town Show. We're here in Best Buy in Glendale, Arizona. And right now, we're at the GoPro kiosk. GoPro is a fantastic little camera. You've probably seen these around. You see someone with it on their head or maybe on their bike. Basically, the idea is to capture your life. And you can get them right here at Best Buy. Have you ever wanted to do what this guy is doing? Ski, whatever. Watch your kids, family, friends. Just stick a camera somewhere. GoPro can help you watch your life happen from different angles that you never even thought of before. You want to put it on your dog? Actually, that'd be pretty cool. Put it on your dog, just strap it to your dog's back, and just see what your dog gets into for the day. (laughs) Available at Best Buy or online at BestBuy.com. Remember, turn on your life with Best Buy. This segment is brought to you by Anabi Law, the entrepreneur's law firm. Call today to arrange a free consultation at 602-845-0152.
Welcome back to the Talk Around Town Show. Behind me is a helicopter that was actually in Vietnam. This is Helicopter 174, and as you can see by the big cross on the nose, it was a medevac copter. So standing with me now is Steve Maloney, who is the contemporary artist behind this magnificent piece of work. Steve, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Delighted to be here. It is a repurposed, transformed uh, Huey helicopter. It was shot down in 1969 in the Vietnam War. Actually, it was on February 14th, 1969, and two soldiers died bravely. It was a medevac unit, and they died bravely when it had to make a crash landing, and they had to hop out. And um, the other three crew were eventually airlifted. It has a, a great history to it, and it has a connection to the Vietnam War, and it's a project that combines um, a documentary film that we are creating that I commissioned to go with it, and also a song sung by Jeannie Cunningham. So it has a history, it has a serial number, 174, and through that serial number we were able to trace the uh, soldiers that served and uh, reunited, in fact, the pilot and the door gunner and another uh, alternate pilot that flew in the, in the same craft. inside this when it crashed, correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So I was the door gunner on this ship uh, in a medical evacuation mission in Vietnam in February of 1969. Now, this piece is here to raise awareness about PTSD and really just make people understand what went on during the war. So would you mind telling us, uh, if, if you're comfortable telling us, you know, what happened, just kind of describe the event to me. Uh, of 14th of February, 1969. This was, uh, as I said a moment ago, this was a medevac helicopter. Our job was to go out and pick up wounded soldiers. We got a call earlier that morning that they had several wounded soldiers. We cranked up the bird and went out to uh, the area, to the LZ, to pick up the soldiers. They were still in contact. They were still in actual firefight. That didn't stop us. We made our approach in to pick up the patients. But uh, the aircraft started taking hits, started taking rounds, which caused uh, malfunctions. We started. Um, we were taking rounds underneath the aircraft. They were coming up right underneath. On my side, the right side, I could feel them, and you could hear them smack the aircraft. And uh, at that point, we started uh, having mechanical issues as a result of taking rounds. We started leaking fuel. We had taken rounds in a hydraulic system, and we started having electrical problems, and the pilots had their hands full trying to get this, this ship back to safety. 
We never did pick up the patients. We had to turn around because we had all sorts of mechanical issues at this point. Uh, but fortunately, at that point, we were all still alive. Um, the aircraft did not make it back to a safe place. We ended up crash landing uh, a few minutes later. And upon the crash landing, we lost uh, two crew members. Their names are memorialized on the skids. Steven Schumacher's name is here. He was the medic that day. And on the left side of the skid is Gary Dubach's name, and he was the crew chief that day. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me about this, and I know it's been uh, quite a journey for you as well as many other veterans, and there's still uh, hundreds of thousands of veterans from the Vietnam War that, that haven't opened up and haven't confronted issues that they're having, you know, whether it's, as you stated earlier, uh, because they just, they aren't aware or they don't think that people will understand or will want to listen. So how, what challenges did you face um, when you came home and then just, you know, in the time since? Um, as I've said several times, uh, the Vietnam War was probably this country's most divisive war um, after the Civil War. And what I mean by divisive is not that it was North versus South, but rather that half the country was for the conflict, half the country was not. And so when we came back from Vietnam, uh, it's not something we talked openly about. People just did not want to hear it. And so all Vietnam veterans, I think, uh, internalized all of their issues. I don't think that there's any veteran of any conflict that doesn't have some level of survivor guilt and that doesn't have some level of post-traumatic stress. You can't be 19, 20 years old, uh, see what we saw, dealt with what we dealt with every day, come home and just uh, blend back in to, to normal, regular, everyday life. And it's just something that sticks with you forever, something you never let go of. And uh, some veterans could handle it more easily than others. For those that couldn't handle it, it, it really torn and shattered their lives, uh, but I think every veteran has had some impact, the Vietnam War had some impact upon his life in some way. It manifested in various ways, but it had some impact upon him. Right, and as you stated, you know, it was very hard for people to talk about it, it still is to this day, so thank you so much for being here and thank you for your service as well. well and thank you very much, we're yeah. very proud of what we did. Thank you. With red crosses on them, they look like angels. So she says, we're all silent in prayer. Bring him to me, yeah. Bring him home, you weep. Keep daddy safe from harm for mommy and me. Oh, bring him home, you weep. To our waiting arms. The parts from the Huey helicopter that came off that are broken. Uh, it's kind of a metaphor now for broken and shattered lives and a torn war that was never understood. And so there are pieces of honeycomb aluminum as an example, or there could be an altimeter or a fuel gauge, an old radio. And, and uh, it's just to, again, bring the art piece uh, forward, continue the conversation. On the wrap, there's not only spray paint and some other work that you've done, but there's text written across. What does the text symbolize? I thought it would be important to bring homage to uh, the uh, helicopter squadrons that served in Vietnam. So those are actually squadron names of helicopter squadrons fr uh, from, from that period of time. And um, they're interfaced and overlaid with a graffiti pattern, and then also included kind of a uh, graffiti style of the nicknames that are used for those squadrons. We have a website called takemehomehuey.org and on there you'll find a schedule of events where we are and uh, going next and you'll see uh, a, document, a little, little teaser from the documentary film and also see the making of the song and you'll find out all kinds of information. Finally, I wanted to tell you that there's a time capsule inside as well. Right, tell that, us about that. I saw that earlier. Yeah, the time capsule uh, we're soliciting now. Um, uh, kind of a call out to uh, some of the vets that served in, in the military to uh, provide us with uh, some photographs or letters home and or maybe something that they carried to be put in the time capsule at the end of the tour. Well, we're starting to collect and curate them now and uh, at the end of the tour then a three-year tour we'll seal it up and to be open probably about 10 years after that period of time. But it's dedicated to the almost 2,800,000 Americans that served in Vietnam.
I've heard people call you visionary, I've heard people call you a patriot, and there's just so many names floating around, but overall, everybody is completely happy with this project. So thank you again so much for doing this, and we really appreciate it. Guys, make sure you check out TakeMeHomeHuey.org because this helicopter is going around the country on tour for the next three years. So again, thank you for being here, and I'm Dan Weeks from the Talk Around Town Show. We'll be right back. are clever. A dog can turn a pool into the world's largest belly flop, turn an outstretched paw into a handshake, and turn your backyard into a launch pad. Cats can turn a ball of foil into a game of keep away, and a closet into an ambush. With nothing more than their own happiness at being with you, pets can turn an empty day into a full one. To us, that is clever. Welcome back to the Talk Around Town Show. Take Me Home Huey is an incredible exhibit. The fact that Steve was able to, first of all, get this helicopter yeah. and do what yeah. he did with it just blows my mind. It's, and I mean, the, the just the artwork on it is, is fantastic. Like, there's so much going on. It's, it's, it's And it has the Chevy and the, uh, the, the California beach girl and all that kind of reminiscent of the time, the era. The era, having like a girl on your, on your, on your plane or on your, on your <laughs> Huey. Yeah, and so we've got, <laughs> it's supposed to, um, be therapeutic for the soldiers, which yeah. it is. There were a lot of veterans throughout the three or four days it was at Rio Vista Park in Peoria who were touching the helicopter and just when they touched the helicopter you could see something happen for them, like yeah. something was complete. Well, when you when you touch something, it, it can make it more real. It can bring back, you know, yeah. memories. I mean, some of these guys remember Maybe flying a little in these closure. things. Well, they had. You know. We we talked to uh, the pilot who actually flew that, and then the the door gunner that was there when it crashed. And it's for him that was that was one of the hardest interviews for me to do, yeah. because you could see all this, and it was so emotional for mm -hmm. him. But really, it was uh, just so so great that so many veterans who weren't appreciated when they came home who went from a war zone yeah. to, you know, a country not appreciating them, yeah. could at this point, uh, while, you know, while they're finally still able to see it, yeah, finally yeah. be appreciated. So we have two books. There were two books at the exhibit. One's called Once a Warrior, Wired for Life, and then the other one is Nomvet. And these two books are incredible. They're a great read. Once a Warrior uh, illustrates how to turn negatives into positives and talks about basically the transition from being a soldier to a civilian. And then the Vietnam veterans here entering the 21st century, this is kind of just a recap, you know, for, yeah. it's a book mainly for veterans, but it's a great read. And these are both special edition books. So, although they weren't written by Steve, the artist who did the helicopter, I have two signed copies here. Steve uh, has autographed both of these copies um, of these books. And so, what we want to do on the show is, since this is such an important message and we all do feel... You know, very strongly, we Extremely do important. we do yeah. want to give back to the community. Uh, we want to raffle these two books off. And you can be a veteran. You don't have to be a veteran, but it's open to anybody. Uh, go to our website, thetalkaroundtownshow.com, and we'll have a page for raffles up. So just enter our raffle. Just sign up for our Members Club newsletter. And whoever wins in a couple weeks, uh, we'll send you both of these books for free, autographed by the artist. By the artist. By the artist. So, so great reads. And remember, guys, these guys... You know, one, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, once a Marine, always a Marine. And yeah. whether you're a Marine or in the Army or in the Air Force or what have you, you, you never stop being that. Yeah. Well, and the other part, the, one of the other sayings that I heard during the seminar, uh, the PTSD seminar, which really stuck with me, was always respect the old man in a profession where men die young. Mm. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, but there's so many veterans <laughs> now who are retired and and dealing with this because yeah. you know you can compartmentalize for so long, but when you retire and you don't have kids to raise, you don't have a job mm -hmm. to go to, you really start you know issues start coming out. And and right. guys, it's, it's if you're a veteran impact, or if yeah. you know somebody who is a veteran, uh, please know that there's there's absolutely no shame in getting help. You know you uh, you rely on your brothers and sisters when you're over there fighting. When you come home, it's absolutely no different. 
Um, yeah. Everybody's here for you to support you. So if you guys feel like you may need to talk to somebody, go talk to somebody. Because that's really, that's that's how the process starts of healing. Hey Amen. Way so. to go, Dan. <laughs> well, thank you. So emotional. <laughs> it, no, but really, right it's, it's a very important topic. So, uh, so guys, we're giving these two books away. Thank you so much for joining us. And stick around, and we'll see you next week.